All right, boys and girls, it's your boy, BQ. I know this one's late. This is really, really late. This is your Impact Lounge Impact review from last week's Impact. I mean, the new episode of Impact is coming out tomorrow, right? If you've been riding with me the last couple uploads, especially uh, when I was reviewing No Surrender, I just explained that I've got a lot, a lot going on right now personally. It's going to slow down a little bit next week. Um, I actually took the rest of the month off from work, but um, with my own business, that's that's going to have me very busy, it, but it will slow down, and hopefully I kind of get back to normal a little bit, uh, but this month is probably, for the most part, just going to be reviews, and then next month, hopefully I'll get back into some more additional content, but um, I've just got too much going on really to focus on the channel, so my apologies. Hopefully this will be one of my last uploads from my cell phone my computer uh as i've been stating i was getting in i was having an issue with getting a good quality stream uh not the internet it's not the ram so i've got it with my my computer guy because uh, it's i guess it's a deeper issue than that which is odd because it's a newer computer but trying to figure out just um what's going on with all that so uh still kind of working from the cell phone here a little bit I apologize. I want to talk about this last week's episode of Impact, though, and I'm going to do it a lot quicker than I typically do when I'm talking Impact. I thought this was a really good episode. I enjoyed it, really, for the most part, from top to bottom. Um, and right now, they're they're on fire. I think they're doing a good job. I thought No Surrender was excellent. I thought this was a very solid show. I saw some people saying this show was just okay. I mean, we all like different things, dislike different things. I personally enjoyed it. And um, I really want to still have the chance to talk to you guys about it. And before tonight's episode, or not tonight, before tomorrow's episode. Uh, so this thing kicked off, and I guess on the more negative side, we're back to the slow motion highlights. After no, or excuse me, after no surrender, after hard to kill, they kind of switched things up a little bit. Where half the highlights were in normal time, normal speed, and. Then they switch it up to slow motion. Now it is like what they used to do before. So the show in general is basically become impact again with with the TNA logo and, and new colors. But that's not to say, and I'm just talking about the presentation of it because the shows, I think, have been um, two, three times better than what they were doing in really the majority of last year. So for the most part, I've been really enjoying things. There's been a couple episodes this year that I'm like, eh, they're okay. But for the most part, I thought they've been pretty good. Just to get my production qual uh, production quality rent out of the way, they uh, this looked more like uh, no surrender, where there was not the you know the oversaturation and and, and everything like that in post production. They instead went with the piss yellow filter. So it's always going to be one of the two. It's either we put it through post-production and we fuck with it to the point that it looks awful. Or we kind of leave it more naturally looking where we can see the crowd. But we're going to put the piss yellow filter on. It's always going to be one of the two. The, the talks of production quality upgrades clearly are not in the cards. Clearly not something that's going to happen. So this is just what we're getting going forward but the production aside from the, you know the um the logo and some of the transitions and some of the stuff they're doing with the graphics which looks excellent with the exception of that it's basically impact this kicked off with mike bailey versus steve macklin and i've made it pretty clear i'm not the biggest mike bailey fan in the world just because his character doesn't connect with me that's all it is i don't i don't discount anything that man does in the ranks he puts on some great matches and then, of course, Steve Macklin's my guy. This was an excellent match. Steve Macklin has proven that he can go with anybody. It doesn't matter what their style is. He has wrestled Josh Alexander, Jonathan Gresham. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's fucked around with a couple of these luchadors. He's made it work every single time. This guy's just amazing. And um, this was this was great. This was an awesome match. I kind of popped that uh, he was going for the headbutt off the top rope, and then <laughs> called it the the um, what do you, what do you call it? The jar headbutt. 
<laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. So um, really cool. I give Tom Hannafin some props because he, at one point Macklin hit the mayhem for all and Mike Bailey kicked out of it, which we don't normally see, but it's not his finisher anymore. So Tom Hannafin kind of pointed out, you know, he's won a lot of matches with that in the past and um, just kind of put it over because it's true. Sometimes announcers will say that, like, oh, Matt Hardy's won so many matches with the side effect when really he's not pinned a single person with it. So he kind of put the move over, giving it some importance because it is kind of an alternate finisher for him. But then he uh, ultimately won with the KIA, and uh, I thought it was excellent. Um, I'm going to go on a rant here a little in a little bit about the Rascals, but I'm going to finish my point here. Macklin did a promo afterwards asking, where's Nick Nemeth? Exactly, where the fuck is he? You know, he came over, had all this hype, but he had uh, Japan dates. So, I've said this the majority of my Impact reviews this year, and I could be very, very wrong. I actually hope I'm wrong, but I really think that Ash by Elegance was the big signing. I think that Nick Nemeth is going to do dates, just like we've seen other guys come in and just do dates and then disappear. I mean, that's part of the that's part of the storyline, right? But that might be the there might be a swerve in that. You know, maybe that's why Macklin is pointing it out because maybe Nick Nemeth actually is around long term. You know, so that's going to be really interesting. But then they did a Nick Nemeth video acting like he was talking from via satellite <laughs> in in real time, which we know is pretty much impossible um but they went ahead and did that and they set up the match for sacrifice so mac sacrifice looks excellent it i kind of a hot take but i think it's going to be better than rebellion <laughs> i just think the matches overall are just gonna be more interesting but we'll we'll see i've got a rant here this may go longer than the rest of the review uh, the rascals coming out in what Matt Raywall said are military fatigues. Let me let me put you guys up on some game. Nobody, and I mean nobody in the military, refers to our uniforms as fatigues or camo. That is some Hollywood shit. That is not terminology that we use. The reason for my rant. I have served for 23 years. It is something that is a big part of me. It's something I'm very proud of. It means a lot to me. I've done 17 and a half active years. I've done, I don't know, four or five reserve years. I have been many places downrange overseas. I've deployed six or seven times. Um, I've been to Iraq twice. I have showered with bottles of water. When I say shower, our showers were pouring bottles of water over ourselves. Uh, when we wanted to have dinner, we had to walk two miles to get there. I have had some rough times. I've had some good times. Um, I have missed a lot of holidays. I have. I almost missed the birth of my daughter, my firstborn. Uh, many years ago, I was able to make it back a couple weeks in advance. Um, even though the Air Force is not the primary war fighting force, I, I did lose people in my units. I have lost, um, you know, friends to suicide. I lost my, my wife in 2012 to suicide. Um, it's really, it, it means a lot to me. And I have an issue when you got a couple guys who, to my knowledge, have not served a day in their life coming out and wearing what they perceive to be military uniforms in what I find to be a complete mockery of veterans and of those who have served, who currently serve. I understand that they're teamed up with Steve Macklin and he is as authentic and legitimate as they come. I get that. Once upon a time when Steve Macklin was the world champion, I had said, you know, I would attach a security detail to him. Very similar to what they're doing with Ali, as a matter of fact. Very similar. 
but you can Hollywood it up a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not even against the rascals in this role. But, you know, as I said, you could Hollywood it up. Like, Steve Macklin could be like, hey, if you guys are going to roll with me, you got to go through what I went through. And you can put them through some, you can do a video package putting them through some bullshit uh, obstacle course, doing some, like, search and rescue shit. You know what I mean? It, 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 it you're churching it up a little bit. You're, you're definitely making it in Hollywood, but you could do something like that and then almost kind of repackage them as serious individuals who, you know, who fit his demeanor. I've always thought Steve Macklin came off as a, as a veteran, very authentic. And it, it's connected with me. Unlike someone like Lacey Evans, when they try to do the military thing with her it was it was inauthentic and it didn't connect with anybody so i'm not against doing something like this but coming out um trey miguel is in i and i it's hard to see on my phone it looks like it's either the air force or army pattern of pants in tennis shoes and then they've got like a gray steve macklin shirt on and they've got beanies and Zachary Wentz comes out, and he is in a in a pattern that I am not familiar with. I've um, I've served like next to several different uh, military members from other countries, and I feel like it might be like the French military or Norwegian or, or Australian, something like that. It's definitely not uh, United States military. Whatever pattern he has for these pants. And then he's got some some phased out black combat boots that we don't wear anymore. And they both look like fucking fools. They come down and they stand at attention for Steve Macklin in the goofiest way possible. The position of attention is a position of respect. Um, they are doing it in a way that someone does when they're like making fun of the military, where they'll be like, "Yes, sir." You know, and try to stand all straight. That's how that shit comes off. It's goofy. I find it very disrespectful. And if you say, if you, you know, when the people say, oh, well, it's just wrestling, fuck you. Seriously. Um, I, I, gave, I gave enough reasons why this means a lot to me. I've, I've really, like, dedicated the majority of my adult life to it. And it really, really pisses me off seeing individuals come out basically making a mockery um it's like a parody of a of a military member and it bothers me quite a bit and i'm i'm not going to rant like this going forward about it i'll probably ex you know express my displeasure over them but going out there with goofy smirks on their face standing at attention walking around doing poor very poor form salutes uh, to Macklin, to the to the crowd, you know Steve. Uh, I mean, excuse me, John Cena did not serve, but he presented his way. Like he he kind of built his gimmick a little bit around, um, you know, because he was in the movie The Marine, so he he built his gimmick a little bit about uh, uh, around like being a veteran, you know. But it was more done out of respect for. Um, for the members that serve our country and you know he would do a, a salute and it was proper form you know it was just done with like dignity and respect not what the fuck they're doing um there's two like i don't know how to explain them two classifications of a military member there's enlisted there's the enlisted force and there's the officer corps okay and then your enlisted guys are your like bottom of the barrel private, you know, depending on your branch of the military, your privates, your airmen, whatever it is. And, and then as you progress in rank, you you know, it's the the sergeants, you know, like myself, I'm a technical sergeant. Mike Gilbert is a master sergeant. He's a he's a rank above me. Um, you know, we're a little closer to the top than the than the bottom. And then you have your officers, and you salute an officer. There is no scenario where somebody salutes me. I can progress two ranks, two, three ranks higher. Three ranks higher is my max. There's no scenario where someone salutes me. 
That is not how that works. We as enlisted members salute an officer and they return the salute. Um, this walking around just, just goofy, and there's a proper way to do it. Because it's the military, everything is done. There's a proper way for everything. Just like in wrestling, like if you're gonna do a suplex, there's a proper way to do a suplex, right? The, a, a wrestler would be upset if I decided to record a video in my backyard of me suplexing my brother and I don't know what the hell I'm doing and I and I hurt him, you know, because I, I don't have the training. There is a, in every profession, there is a proper way to do everything. And what they do to me comes out as a complete mockery and it actually upsets me quite a bit. They get a little bit of a pass because there was Steve Macklin and he, uh, you know, he clearly giving it the go ahead. So if he's cool with it, I guess like I gotta be right. But uh, I am, I am, I am, and I'm not someone who's like triggered or, or gets, you know, that's not my personality. But I am, I do feel disrespected by the way uh, these guys uh, present themselves as like some kind of fake. I, I don't even know what it is, but. We're just going to move on from that. As I said, that that rant was probably going to go longer than the rest of this show, but um, I just don't like it, and I'm I'm not going to like it going forward. <laughs> I can I can tell you right that right now. As I said, there's a way of doing it, uh, and you can almost semi repackage them into a more serious role, not the same like goofy potheads guys who are, you know, coming off very in inauthentic, and it just bothers me tremendously. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Kaz is, because Frankie Kazarian is approached backstage by a bunch of security goofs, and they're letting him know that he has been, actually, they haven't said anything. They're just not letting him through. And I always think it's so silly when it shows a wrestler arriving halfway through a show, because shouldn't everyone be there for bell time? You know, if we're just kind of being realistic. You know, if someone's like, they'll be like, oh, here's Moose arriving for the main event. And it's like the main events in 20 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Like, wouldn't you, wouldn't you be panicking? Like, where's our world champion? Anyway, he comes up and um, Jim Miller approaches him with a microphone, letting him know that he has been suspended. I got suspended from my job last week, folks. Last week, last month. Um, I'm not going to say why, but I got suspended for a week. <laughs> I had to go into to the office and sign paperwork, and it's it was an official like, hey, you are acknowledging your suspension without pay. Like, you don't send. They didn't send the the HR person to my home to let me know that I've been suspended. So um, they didn't send the secretary. You know what I mean? Like that was just. You don't just send Gia Miller like, hey, you've been suspended. Like on behalf of fucking Santino and Gail Kim and all these people. Like get the hell out of here. Passing all passing along the message. Anyway, Frankie Kazarian has been suspended, which he's doing some of the best work in the company, the best heel work right now, and it just shows that you can get over as a heel. Because he, shoot, there was very few company, few in the company as over as a babyface as he was, and he switched it up pretty quickly, and he got people to boo him and legitimately boo him. So he's just doing tremendous work right now. After this, we got Laredo Kid versus Jake Something. Uh, Tom Hannafin let us know it was a first time ever matchup, so we're back to this shit. And he called them Kid and Something like they're his last names. I um, I was happy that Jade, when she introduced Jake Something, she actually threw in the he is Jake Something because he I've said this before. They don't say where he's from, what he weighs, nothing. They just say Jake Something, and it just comes off like he's a jobber. So I was kind of happy that they, I don't know, they changed it up a little bit to where, you know, he sounded like a bigger deal. For whatever reason, he doesn't want to say he's from, you know, buttfuck Michigan or whatever it is. But, um, you know, I, I thought it was good that they did this. And Jade is, um, I think she's getting better week to week. There was a spot here where Laredo Kid did a hurricanrana on the outside and Jake something rolled through it and hit him with a power bomb. That was one of the sickest moments of the night i thought that was excellent jake something won the match of course they are pushing him to challenge for the x division championship he's not a guy that wins a whole lot you know he won that six way in january 
which was really good. That was an excellent six-way. But then he lost to Frankie Kazarian for whatever reason. I don't even know why they booked that match. So he's 1-1, one and one, and now he won this, so he's 2-1. and one. So that means he is the number one contender for the X Division Championship. So I believe they announced that for Sacrifice. If they didn't, I'm sure they're going to. No, I'm sure they didn't announce it yet. There's no way because there's been no build on television. But he's clearly the direction they're going to challenge for the X Division Championship. And with Ali being the champion, they're going to have a struggle to where they're going to have to do some kind of storylines for the contenders because that's not a dude who you can just give them random opponents like you were doing with Chris Saban. So, um, yeah, this was just kind of a Laredo kid doesn't beat anybody. So Jake something wins. I appreciated that after the match they did a very legit plug for TNA Plus, letting them letting us know it's nine ninety nine or nine ninety five, whatever it is. And I love the tagline that you haven't seen anything until you see everything. I think that's great. That's those are the kind of things I've been talking about since day one with marketing. So I can dig it. Uh, but that, I thought that was one of the more legit plugs they've done with the app in quite some time. Then we got a sound check segment with Alan Angels. I like these. I know some people don't. I like them. I I I take I personally take it as like a rib on me, even though I I know it's not. I say that jokingly, but it's it's like a rib on me because it's just pointing out all of the horrible production snafus that we have gone through in the last several years. I mean, they even got the purple lights in the background. They look completely out of place. I think the shit's funny. I think I think it I I think it's good television personally, you know. It it's it is what it is. It's a 5-minute segment. I can dig it. You know, it's better than locker room talk with Madison Rain and um I like Tennille Dashwood's show a little bit. That was that was kind of funny to me too, but they've they, you know, they've tried to do these interviews before and I just think this one's funny personally. But he has Khan on, and Khan says, long time no see, or whatever it was. So they're acknowledging that there's a history there. And I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't find a way to tag these guys up. Because I don't think... What they're doing with Khan right now, I don't think you can sustain it long term, him being a singles wrestler. So I wouldn't be surprised if these two didn't link up in one way, shape, or form. But um, I, I thought it was funny that Angels kept calling him, or referring to himself <laughs> as the big bro, like... That dude, he, he you know, he, he got a lot of um, YouTube time with the with the Young Bucks show, whatever the hell it's called, or being the elite with uh, when he was with the Dark Order. So, you know, he I, I think he's just a naturally funny guy. He's got a lot of experience doing this kind of like just bad comedy, but actually making it come off. So the, there's one thing. So PCO of course shows up. And there's one thing about Khan's this this neck snap move he does. Someone pointed this out to me in the comments on YouTube, and I, honest to God, didn't even think about it. He does these neck snaps, and there, he's trying to get this move over, but he does it, and in some cases, multiple times, and the wrestler appears again the next week on television. They're not selling it. They're not selling that they're injured. They're not in a neck brace. They're not in the hospital. Nothing. They're just back on TV again the next week like AEW does. Just just back. Doesn't matter what the injury is in AEW, that person is back the next week. So they're not they're gonna they're really gonna struggle trying to get that move over. It's a very silly move. Decay did a promo after this. They were name dropping some females that I had no clue who the hell they were. You know, some historical names. Maybe I'm just uninformed, uneducated, but I didn't know who they were talking about, but these segments are pretty good and it's, you know, it's better than the undead realm stuff, obviously. Obviously. They announced Hammerstone versus Alexander 2. Some people do disagree with me on this, which is fine, but I think it's way too soon to do this. I don't think it's needed for Sacrifice. Sacrifice has a great card. The Impact Plus or TNA Plus shows are the probably least watched thing that they do. I I I think Explosion probably gets more views than those. So, I just to me, it's a little bit of a waste to do that. Neither of those guys should be losing right now. Josh has taken a couple losses recently. 
which I think is refreshing, but I don't think he needs to take a, another one at this point. And Hammerstone, who's the new assignee, definitely doesn't need to take a loss. I've been happy with what they've been doing with Josh Alexander. He's essentially uh, wrestling in the mid card right now because there was a segment with this um, after this, which I'll get to in a second, featuring Dirty Dango, and they're going to have a match next week. But Josh is basically wrestling in the mid card. That was one thing that John Cena did once upon a time that breathed a, a lot of life into him. So he's having pretty decent matches with, with guys that you would never see him wrestle last year. Ever since he got to the company, he's been wrestling for titles, with titles, kind of been in the main event picture, whether it was the tag team championships or the, or the singles. It's even hard. It's, it's crazy to believe he was a heel at one point. Um, but they're doing a really good job with him right now. I'm very pleased with it, but he's doing a backstage interview with Gio, and the, the interviews are looking a little better. You can still see shadows, but they're, they're looking better. And then Dango comes out, and so Dango comes out with Bravo and Oleg Prudius, and they look like I, I'm not a, I'm not out on their gimmick by any I mean by excuse me by any means. I do enjoy their television, but they look like three 14 year olds. Actually, that's probably pretty old. They look like three six year olds that went into their grandmother's closet and came out wearing whatever they could find. There's no continuity with what with their look. I don't really get it what they're going for, but there's just like no consistency within within them as a unit. They look as thrown together as as you could possibly throw three people together. I'm not out on the gimmick. There's a lot within them that does entertain me, but I just wish there was a little more continuity. Then they had Ali's. Uh, inauguration. I thought this was very good. He is a tremendous talker. The problem is he comes off as a baby face and the people get behind him. And Chris Sabin came out and, you know, he cut a promo, which I thought he sounded good. And uh, to, to rewind here a little bit, what his look that he's got going on right now is similar to what I envisioned for Steve Macklin when he was world champion. But he, you know, Ali cuts these promos or babyface promos. He's naturally the crowd. He, it's so natural, it's so good that the crowd is behind him. And Chris Sabin comes out and you know tells him, you know, don't talk to him like a politician. Talk to him like a man or whatever it was he said. Sabin sounded pretty good. But then Ali comes back and says, "Not a not a damn soul supports you." And all of a sudden, Ali chants are coming and. I don't think Chris Saban was ready for that. And it made him look like a goof. And if you go back to Hard to Kill and Moose was taken on Alex Shelley, the crowd was behind Moose. And then Ali took on Chris Saban, the crowd was behind Ali. They were behind, excuse me, behind Ali here. I really hope they're turning the Motor City Machine Guns heels because these were your champions, your two top champions for the majority of 2023. And they're not even the most over people in their matches or in their feuds. That's why I thought this was the right time to turn them against each other. To breathe some life into them. But I think they got very bland and stale with the people. And they wanted something different. I hope that they're turning heels and taking on Kushida and Kevin Knight. I think that would be entertaining. But keeping them at ba as baby phases at this point, I think, is a mistake. Um, Ali is so good that he even he even has John Schuyler getting reactions. I thought after the brawl, when Ali was backstage and and saying, you know, th this was paid for by campaign funds, he is getting a silly gimmick over. Where it's not, it's silly, but it's it's not silly because he's doing it. Like if somebody else was, it would come off so ridiculous. And he even has the good hands, and they're ridiculous. But he is making this work. It's it's quite fascinating. So he's one of the better parts of the show right now. But um, but yeah, there was a brawl, and Kevin Knight and Kashida came out, and they're you know they're kind of making it a point that 
the four of them aren't really together at the same time. So I don't know. There's going to be some kind of dissension there. There has to be. When I say the four, I mean the intergalactic time splitters or whatever the hell they are, and then the motors, Motor City Machine Guns. Then we got Tasha Steeles versus Zaya Brookside. The match is okay. I think Zaya Brookside has the potential to be a major baby face for this company. And I think Tasha Steeles has that same potential. Lazy booking one-on-one. They wrestled to a no... Uh, no, not a no no contest. It was a double count out. I don't remember the last time I've seen a count out in wrestling, let alone a double count out. So it was just so, 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 so lazy. And then Jordan Grace comes out and says, you know, I, I'll make this easy. I'm going to wrestle the two of you. So we're not elongating Jordan Grace's title feud. We're just going to throw her multiple opponents at the same time. Um, Tasha Steeles and Zaya Brookside are one on one and one versus each other. They're one one and one, and that qualifies them for number one contendership for the Knockouts World Championship. Ash by Elegance came out. She looked amazing, by the way. Incredible. Uh, Iceman was using words like huge and humongous, and I agreed. But um, she looked really good, and. I got the Iceman rub on Twitter. He follows me now. Gail Kim follows me. So every, every month or two, I get someone that um, that follows and surprises me. The Gail Kim one definitely took me by surprise. But I was glad to get Iceman on there too. And I think he's doing a very good job as the... Uh, I can't say that word. It's going to take me a while to even remember it. But the role he plays for Ash... He does well. Um, Jordan Grace is going to win this three-way at uh, Sacrifice. I wish it was just a one-on-one match with one of those girls, but it's not. It's a three-way. She's going to win, and that's they're going to set up uh, Ash versus Jordan. And I think Ash is going to win the title and, and hold it for, for quite some time. I don't know how over the Ash gimmick is getting right now. Like She came out, and you could clearly hear one person clapping. You know, so... I think she's got a lot of a lot of work to do. I think she's very talented, but she she's got some work to do to really to get this thing over. But I've I've been happy with it personally so far. And then the main event was the system versus Eric Young and the Ace and Bay connection. On cue, as I just said at No Surrender during my review, and I think I said it on my last review as well of M- Impact, is that I wish the system didn't tailor their look to Eddie Edwards because Eddie Edwards has the history of being the most bland person in the company, the person who needs to be updated the most often. And, you know, they're all wearing green. He's still got the ride or die shirt that he's been wearing for, I mean, God, since Clinton was in office. And, you know, now, now these motherfuckers uh, have the system t-shirts These shirts should have been out when they cut the first promo with D'Angelo Williams at Hard to Kill. This company just doesn't get it when it comes to merch. That's when the iron would have been the hottest. But at least we do have system merchandise now. And it's gray and black. And it looks better. And it gives Eddie Edwards a different look, thank God. And the system is... is They're getting a lot of momentum they're winning a lot of matches. At the beginning, they lost a couple, but they're winning a lot of matches. And they're looking like they're going to come off as a dominant faction, which is rare. <laughs> it seems like every dominant, every faction gets their asses whooped. We thought Honor No More were going to be them dudes, and they just lost all their matches. Only person who won was Eddie and PCO. Everyone else is losing all the time. And, you know, these guys are winning. I think they're going to win the tag team championships. It makes sense why Ace and Bay kept them at no surrender. But I think these guys are going to to win the titles. I think they're going to have all the titles. Um, in a perfect, in BQ's perfect world, Alicia would have the knockouts championship as well. I know that's not going to happen, but um, it, this was, I didn't see this outcome coming. I actually thought Eric Young needed the momentum going into sacrifice, but the system won. But I know, I know TNA and whatever they're doing tomorrow, Eric Young will, will come out on top. But I would love to see, you know, the system just continue their dominance. You know, if they put another match with Eric Young and Moose, 
on impact this week. I hope Moose wins again. Just keep the heat going. Keep it strong. My only concern is that the system is becoming like the era that I got completely burnt out coming into the company and I had to have other people step in for me. And it was when every single week was some kind of main event combination of Tessa Blanchard, Brian Cage, Moose, Killer Cross, Johnny Impact, and uh, might have been Sammy Callahan or something. I, I don't remember. It was like the same five or six people, and it just felt like we were just seeing the same thing every single week. And it's kind of coming across that with the system now. Something that AEW used to do when they were really faction heavy was that they would pair off the faction members and tag teams quite a bit rather than have them all wrestle together at the same time. So you would have like a stable like the Dark Order, and even though they were broken up into tag teams within the stable, every once in a while they'd be like, okay, well, Evil Uno and Ten are wrestling together. You know what I mean? They would just kind of pair up, you know, Cole Cabana and Ellen Angels are going to wrestle as a team. They would just switch it up. So I think what would keep things fresh with the system is that one week Moose teams up with Eddie Edwards or he teams up with Brian Myers. You know, just, just to switch it up so it's not always a six-man tag. It's not always uh, Myers and Eddie together, you know. Um, I thought once upon a time they did Sammy Callahan teamed up with, with Dave Crist, and I thought that was just really fresh from normally what they were doing with OVE. So I think that's just something you can do to to freshen it up a little because it is feeling like we're seeing the same main event every week, even though we're really not. The uh, the opponents are changing, but it just sound it just feels the same a little. I th- I really like that triple. I don't even know what you call it. It's not a tandem move. Like all three of them, this finisher they did they did where Eddie's got. Chris Bay in the backpack stunner. Moose comes, gives him a big boot to the face. He hits the backpack stunner. And just poetry in motion, Brian Myers hits, uh, I, think it, I think it was an elbow off the top. I had to watch a couple times. It looked like a leg drop at first, but I'm like, there's no way that dude can do a leg drop. So I believe it was an elbow, but it was very, very impressive. Poetry in motion. It was absolutely beautiful. And uh, the system reigns supreme. So good episode, good episode. And we'll see what happens tomorrow night. I'm your boy BQ. Thanks for rocking with me. I'm out. Peace.